Welcome to the Brain Food Show. This is episode four in an epic. It even says it right there in the title, an epic space series. Is that just our working title or is that the actual title? Yeah, that is just the working because I couldn't think of a title when I was originally titling. Well, I like that it's epic because this one really does go on. Just before we jump into everything today, we're going to be changing up the format of the show a tiny little bit for our regular listeners. We're going to be doing the sort of follow-up that we do normally at the beginning. We're going to be doing it after the main content just because, well, we like listening to feedback and people are like, can you get on with the main, like, especially I think new listeners rather than uh, regular listeners were like, hey guys, jump into the stuff and then follow up later. And I was kind of like, well, that makes a lot of sense. And Dave was kind of like, that makes a lot of sense. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, I just want to hit a few things before we do get started. Leave us a review. We are doing a contest uh, when we get to 200 reviews on iTunes. We're going to be giving away, uh, was it a $200 Amazon gift card to someone randomly, but from all of the review platforms. So mm-hmm. leave us a review. We also sometimes read them on the show, but we're not going to be doing that now because, you know, we're going to jump straight into the content. And also let us know how we're doing on Twitter with the hashtag brain food show. Uh, I was going to say all one word, but that's how hashtags work. So I didn't really need to say that. And in the form of in keeping things brief, should we crack on? What are we talking about today? We're going to start by talking about the uh, the first guy to walk in space and his sort of like the adventures of him. It wasn't a good time. Uh, almost disaster, actually. Yeah, uh, reading through the, the prep material before we got started today, I'm like, wow, it seems like something that you, whatever it is, I was like, I, uh, you, you, wouldn't you test that somehow? Like, we've yeah. talked about people being put in vacuum chambers before and passing out and then killing loads of dogs yeah. and all sorts of horrible things. Listen to our previous episodes if you want to get nice yeah. and depressed about that. But it seems to me this was something they'd figure out, right? But we'll get into it. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, after that, we're going to talk about the uh, why did people think the moon was made of cheese or where did that sort of that idea come about? And then, um, yeah, the uh, U.S. nuking Britain's first satellite. The poor satellite. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we did a video about that one, right? <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, a um, long time ago. Yeah, and a few other things like that. So, Was it Wallace and Gromit? Uh, did you, do you know Wallace and Gromit or is that just a British thing? That sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't actually know. It's a weird... Is. I mean, it's not... It, it's cool. It's like a, a man and his... It's a dog, right? Gromit is a mm. dog. He's a dude. He's Okay, yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. They, he builds a rocket ship and goes to the moon and it's because it's made of Wensleydale cheese and... It's very weird. I remember watching it as a kid. It's quite an unusual thing. Um, yeah. Isn't you know, it a little bit like claymation-y or something like that? Definitely. Well? I think it's entirely claymation. Yeah. Claymation. That's a fantastic word. So who was the first dude who walked in space? Uh, Alexei Leonov. Probably not an American then. I guess. <laughs> no, yeah. It's the Soviet Union. It was almost a, an American, but there was, of course, as I think we mentioned on the last episode, a couple of weeks or a couple of months, maybe delay of that launch and until the <laughs> this was the the whole thing with the space race though right it was all, yeah, almost it was American, a, almost a russian the whole way up yeah so he was a you know veteran of the the soviet air force and all this uh, well well trained he actually uh-huh. trained for 18 months for this particular mission um and it was going to be his first time in space along with his uh his partner there uh pavel what do you think uh Belyayev? yeah i'd say Belyalev. you could call him pb yeah so it was the uh, the Voskhod 2 mission, uh, they launched, and uh, yeah, so they go up in orbit, and he straps on his little uh, EVA suit, backpack to his spacesuit, and uh, this provides him with about 45 minutes of oxygen, and also, um, so it, you know, not just to breathe, but also to keep cool. They didn't really have like a super sophisticated cooling uh, method there. Uh, it was just sort of like let the let the sort of carbon dioxide and stuff out and put yeah. new new fresh air in, which is cooler, um, so it wasn't super fancy. But, Importantly, uh, though, because people might be thinking, isn't space really cold? Our previous yeah. episode deals with that yeah, one. No, no they, yeah. they definitely had a problem with getting too hot, especially in the yeah. spacesuits. So he's got, they got that relief valve, which is, which is key to the story at hand. He definitely, it's good they had this for getting rid of the, all the, the air inside. It's like it just bloats up something massive. It's like, oh yeah, we needed a vent. Damn. Yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, so they have this, their little spacesuit and they have the airlock itself was inflatable. Uh-huh. Um, so it, it's sort of like once they get up there, they start, uh, they start pressurizing the, the airlock and it starts expanding. And so it gets, you know, nice. And so it takes about seven minutes to actually inflate it. Then uh, he crawls inside and he gets, you know, he then gets himself out, uh, mm-hmm. of the space of the spacecraft. And he's out, he's outside the first time ever a human has done this. He spends about 12 minutes and nine seconds, uh, exactly, uh, out there. And, uh, yeah, it's nice. Everything's going good. And then he, he goes, all right, well. Better get back in. Only got, you know, 40, 45 minutes of air here. And and he didn't fit anymore because mm-hmm. his suit oh. had expanded. 
So he had bloated up a little bit. Yeah, a lot. And so, yeah, he didn't, he, he couldn't really get back in, which is a problem. You're kind of floating around in space. And I'm looking, we've got a, a, a little picture of the Voskhod 2 spacecraft. And this is terrible podcasting, but that we're looking at a picture of the thing. And I'm like, so if that's his airlock, so the guy gets into there, that's a really small spacecraft. So you're not yeah. kind of on the outside of the ISS where you've got some like big, nice thing to kind of hold on to and feel a bit, I don't know, for me, that would make me feel way more comfortable. It's kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, there's this big thing. Whereas if I'm just yeah. going around the earth in this tin, I'm just holding onto this tiny little tin spaceship, like, ah. Uh. Yeah. And, and who's, who's, uh, whose bright idea there was to make the airlock so small that he could just like barely squeeze out in the first place. And then. It's also inflatable, right? Surely you yeah. can get as big as you want. Yeah. It's, uh, so yeah, he's sitting there. He's like, all right, well, I can't fit back in. So uh, he can almost fit back in. It's it's like a tight fit. So he starts to try to get himself in and he doesn't actually tell like ground control or anything like that. What's what's uh, what's up? Because he's like, there's nothing they can do about it. And there was people, people watching, you know, it was a a back home. And so uh, they did once they once the the ground control people saw that there was maybe an issue here, uh, they cut off the feed so that, you know, people, the general public couldn't see it anymore. And they just kind of, oh, technical difficulties, you know, I feel like he should have a safe word. Like yeah. they should be like, everything's going fine. I'm really looking forward to getting home and having my macaroni. Yeah. And then they'd like cut off the transmission or whatever Russian people eat, maybe like have some vodka or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, you can't have the code word. You can't have the safe word vodka because then they'd use it too much. <laughs> yeah. So so he's looking and he's he's trying to wedge himself back in. Uh-huh. And his solution is to, all right, well, I'll just cut off the inflow so so new air won't come into my suit, and then I shall just bleed off some air that's in it right now to lower the pressure, basically. I love these early astronauts. Just like, let's try something insanely dangerous. Yeah, let's just get rid of the, the pressure inside my suit enough to where he could then <laughs> squeeze, you know, then it wouldn't be so tight, you know, uh, it, there would be some give to it. Yeah. Uh, and so this is this is what he's going for. So he starts bleeding off the air slowly and sort of like wiggling slowly, inch by inch, you know, crawling in. And so then uh, he says of this process, I knew I might be risking oxygen starvation, but I had no choice. If I did not re-enter the craft within 40 minutes, my life support would be spent anyway. Ooh, dramatic. Very dramatic, in fact. Yeah. And then he he also goes on of why another reason, you know, he was actually quite grateful that they cut off the feed uh, because... um, My family was therefore spared the anxiety that they would have had to endure had they known how close I came to being stranded in space. Yeah. Yeah. So in the uh, in the uh, several minutes it takes him to wedge himself back in as he's bleeding off the the air there, uh, it ended up his body temperature actually raised three point two degrees Fahrenheit, or that's one point eight degrees Celsius above normal uh, during the process. Yeah, he, he was he was working, you know, yeah. and then uh, yeah, and then he once he got in, then there there was another problem is because so now he's in and it's this long. I mean, we maybe we'll put the picture up in the thing, but it's sort of an elongated like tube looking thing, and so he's in there. Head first. We have to put up the picture. You, you're talking yeah. about the not just the EVA yeah. lock, right, but the whole Vostok 2 spacecraft. Yeah. Yeah. And this so, thing looks like a ray gun. It, it does, actually. Well, I was browsing through the notes and I was like, ooh, we're talking about ray guns. And I was like, <laughs> no, that's the Vostok 2. two uh, we, uh, where, where could people find this? We'll put it up on the forums, right? I'll, I'll, like, I'll, uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll put it up on, on, the, um, on the post or whatever. I don't know if it shows up <laughs> in like iTunes and whatnot, but you can, you can see. And the. Uh, so yeah, so so he gets in there, but now he has to twist around and reach back to pull right. the hatch su- shut, and so he can actually you know repressurize it and you know get there. And so he had to let out even more air to make this happen, so he could kind of do that twist around move. And then he eventually gets it. He 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 managed to shut it, repressurize all all good, um, until he gets back in to the ship. And then more stuff more stuff had gone wrong. So they get back in, and then they're going back. You know, time to go back to earth it's nice you know mission accomplished when it turns we out- talk about the problem about his suit becoming really stiff because i thought this was a really fascinating thing yeah i mean it was just like you know when it was all inflated yeah so he can't really like move much it's like you know i think we were talking about on the last one where the astronauts really have to work like even in modern spacesuits to just close their fist because it just wants to spring back open you know with the air pressure so it's kind of yeah and so yeah exactly it's just kind of stiff it's hard to move at all but ha- hang on, maybe I'm a little confused when I was reading through these notes. So the guy gets back into the spacecraft and because he's bled off the oxygen, right? Now it's like mm-hmm. tighter to him or something. So the suit's like... No, no, the, 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 the tightness was was the before when it was just like completely inflated. Uh, it was just yeah. like, okay. <laughs> just, 
<laughs> yeah. Space suits suck generally. <laughs> yeah. Especially the, you know, the first one that they're going out there. They've never tried that before. So I, I love it in like movies where they're wearing these like super skin tight spacesuits and they've got the giant yeah. piece of glass around their heads and it's like they're wielding like regular guns and shooting them. Like, no, 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 no. No, you'd no. need some like, yeah, I don't know, motors and things probably <laughs> to do everything. Good. Although, I mean, like uh, SpaceX is designing some pretty cool I looking saw this. suits. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, and I don't know what, you know, how they're getting around some of the problems, but they look cool anyway. I think they've probably come back from the design department and are yet to go to the engineers, maybe. Could be the L. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so they get back in. They're going to go back to Earth. And then they, they find out their automatic guiding system is not working. Um, and they're also pretty low on fuel. Like, they don't have a lot of extra to maneuver around. So they, you know, they need to do the pull off the landing manually mm-hmm. and uh, quite, quite well. Um, so, uh, to, and it's actually, it was kind of difficult. So Le- uh, Leonov, he actually describes how difficult, you know, the, the process here. Uh, he stated, a Pasha began orienting, I assume Pasha's the other, uh, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Believ, of course, PB. Uh, Pasha began orienting the craft for re-entry. This was no easy task. In order to use the optical device necessary for orientation, he had to lean horizontally across both seats in the spacecraft <laughs> while I held him steady in front of the orientation porthole. We then had to maneuver ourselves back to the correct positions in our seats very rapidly so that the spacecraft's center of gravity was correct during the re-entry burn. And remember, this is a tiny spacecraft. <laughs> and who designs this thing? Like, you know, like, that they have to lay across both seats to do the right. right, you know, to see the... I guess this is, like, their backup option. Yeah, right? but still, move the window. <laughs> early early space exploration. Things do yeah. break a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so then they had the, the problem also of they had to land um, within the, the Soviet Union because uh, one of the problems was, of course, you have China right there. If they missed and hit China... Uh, China and the Soviet Union not getting along at that point. No, definitely and so, not. So that they didn't want to create like an international incident there. Um, so they, I mean, but to, to be fair, the Soviet Union, big place, you know, relatively yeah. speaking. Well, I'm kind of reading this article and I'm like, oh, you know, it's broken, but you know, fairly big target. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> drain, drain them down. And because you see all these like uh, spaceship landing, or I mean now, or like not now, but like previously when there was the sh- shuttles and stuff, that lands on a runway. I mean, that's really precise. Mm-hmm. But before when they're just ditch into the, the, crazy, when they're ditch into the ocean and stuff, it's like, that's what, two thirds of the Earth's surface. It's a big target, mm-hmm. but yeah. politically complicated in this case. Yeah, yeah. And so, but the, this was, this was, they had another big problem here is that when they start to descend, turns out, the, their their module just starts spinning really really fast and uncontrollably and uh-huh. uh, and their you know manual control at this point and it turns out what happened was the orbital module module which was supposed to detach it mostly detached but it, but they someone apparently I don't know if it was design or just a flaw in whatever thing that was supposed to disconnect automatically but there was this big old cord connecting the, the orbital module and the, the landing one and uh, and it was just still attached it didn't detach and so you had this basically rope between the two things a communication cord right yeah and so and so what ended up happening is they just kept like swinging so they were kind of orbiting each other really fast and accelerating as it as it continued to descend um almost like a slingshot so they were you know and that's going to create amazing amount of g-force and so yeah at the peak they had about 10 g's of force which i was looking and it was kind of around six to seven was the kind of re-entry of those uh yeah. later later apollo missions yeah so 10 g's is pretty good yeah. And considering they're also like, okay, so they lined up everything manually, they're doing that, and they're trying to hit, you know, a certain area. And then you got to be thinking they're sitting in there and just spinning around and they, you know, did they know what was going on at that point? Probably not. They're just like spinning randomly. But luckily for them, around uh, uh, 62 miles high, 100 kilometers, uh, the cable kind of burned up a little bit and snapped. And then they started, you know, the craft, you know, just by design stabilized. And uh, then they, they continued to descend and managed to land in the uh, two meters of snow in Solokamsk, maybe. Sure. Yeah, why not? No idea. Siberia, basically. Not famous for its tropical climes, is it? Yeah, but, you know, maybe the snow cushioned their fall a little bit. But uh, then they had another problem is they tried to get out. They had these explosive bolts around the, the hatch that would blow and then they could they could get out. So they, they did blow. Didn't this kill some Russians later or before? No, that was a different that was a different thing with the, the detachment up up in orbit, which presumably the part where they detached the the um the orbital module and yeah. then it ended up causing the, the valve to open 
Oh, it was a valve, not the bolts. Gotcha. Yeah, well, because the bolts on that case were supposed to go one at a time and they just all blew at once and that caused the pressure that made the valve fail and then uh, they died. The Russians should really work on their explosive bolts. Well, they, in this case, the explosive bolts worked, but they, they couldn't open the hatch. And uh, so then they, they looked, why, why isn't this opening? And uh, so Leonov said... Looking out the window, we could see the hatch was jammed against a big birch tree. Ah, oh, okay, so it's it, we can blame the birch tree on, on this yeah. one. Yeah. We had no alternative but to start rocking the hatch violently back and forth, trying to shift it clear of the tree. Then, using all his strength, Pasha managed to push the hatch away from the remains of the bolts, and it slid back and disappeared into the snow. So yeah, so back in uh, back in the headquarters there, the uh, uh, Leonov and uh, Belyayev's families, they told, I'm completely fine. They landed, they're good, they're resting. We'll have them yeah. back in Moscow. But in fact, the, the officials did not know if they landed safely or whatever. They, they had no communication with them. They didn't know where they landed. They, they didn't even know if they were still alive. And these guys have got, I mean, 10 Gs of pressure. What's that? Yeah. Uh, where was that Leon, Leonov quote? He said, uh, the small bl blood vessels in our eyes burst. So these yeah. guys are kind of in Siberia, in this capsule, pretty messed up. Yeah, like, and it's not like, you know, they're were, they were dressed for, for Siberian weather. Um, no, they're either. dressed for space. As we know, yeah. space is not cold. Oh, I've got an amazing follow-up about this later. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't think I put it in the document, but it's good. You'll you'll be amused by it. It's All not right. informational. It's just fun. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so they did uh, they did have their little transmitter and everything, and they were transmitting, and uh, so some civilian aircraft luckily picked up on it, and uh, and then uh, eventually the the information got passed back to the the headquarters about where they were exactly, mm -hmm. and that they they had landed and were alive, and so but they were in Siberia, and we're gonna have to spend a couple of days there. Uh, not really uh, prepared for that, but the some of the civilian aircraft they they threw supplies down to them, so like um like alcohol and um uh, see what else I think boots as well cognac fancy yeah. yeah 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 which 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 we're gonna do a little aside here because a lot of people think alcohol warms you up in the cold, but in fact it makes you colder, much colder, and makes it much much more likely to get hypothermia if you're drinking it in the cold. I've been pretty cold and I've cracked some whiskey, like camping or whatever. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel pretty good. Or is that just the uh, the mental thing? Yeah, this is exactly why it makes you feel warm is exactly why it's actually cooling you down. Um, yeah. So when you're when you're in the cold, you know, your your uh, your capillaries, uh, they kind of close up, especially, you know, around your skin and your arms and stuff like this. Ah, to bring the blood like to the center, right? Yeah, to, to hold preserve it, your keep, organs, preserve preserve the heat in the center because stuff that matters. <laughs> yeah, the stuff that matters. Uh, and <laughs> they'll and sacrifice your toes because you you need your lungs. <laughs> yeah, and so alcohol is actually a vasodilator, and so it does the opposite of this. It causes mm -hmm. your blood vessels to open up, and so then all that blood, that nice warm blood, goes to the surface of your skin everywhere, and, you're, and that's where all your you know your little temperature whatever nerve endings sensors whatever you want to call uh, them they're yeah. there, and so now you're feeling real warm, but in fact you've just gotten rid of like one of your body's primary ways of of to conserve heat, yeah, and now it's just radiating that heat nicely off into the air. Feel feels pretty feels pretty good though. <laughs> yeah, uh, on top of that, you can also start sweating if you if you really overdo it, like if you're really sloshing back and uh, yeah. and so then it's gonna make the problem even worse um so it's just maximizing blood flow to your to your skin instead of minimizing it like you would mm. so you you feel super warm you're actually really cooling down rapidly but you know you don't notice which also makes it even more dangerous because you don't notice you know that you're actually your core temperature's dropping and you can see this people you know when they look flushed and stuff when they really get sure. drunk so that's that's you know the effect is your blood vessels are just you know opening up and letting well, that blood out if you've got, if you're an alcoholic, right, you kind of get that red face constantly. Is that oh, because yeah. those capillaries have been constantly? Oh, that's kind interesting. Of... Or is it just because they're always drunk? It's possibly. It kind of does come with the territory, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing also it does is so the uh, there was a study done by the Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, and mm -hmm. they actually found the other reason it it can make you even more cold is it it gets rid of your body's um, natural ability and tendency to shiver. Um, so it just oh. stops that from happening. So you won't shiver even though you're cold. And so that's another way your body tries to generate heat. And uh, it's, so that's gone. And then you just, yeah, you just keep getting colder. And uh, yeah, so contrary to popular belief, don't don't drink the alcohol if you're, if you're going to freeze. So I feel like this is a really important survival tip. You can only drink alcohol if you're feeling really cold, closed. If it's kind of like, nah, you, you're done for. You know, if you yeah. just want to feel, if you just want to feel, like if you're, you know, um, Leo, DiCaprio in yeah. the Titanic scene. You know, you, you, it's it's game over. Have a sip. 
you know, make yourself yeah. so comfortable as you float down to the bottom of the Atlantic. Yeah. Well, well, with the last stages of hypothermia, you kind of feel warm anyway, right? You start to get, that's why people take off their clothes and stuff, because they start to feel ah, hot. Didn't know that, really? So, yeah, you can just accelerate that process, I suppose. Yeah. Well, yeah, and people start not thinking straight as well. Their brain stops working as well, and then they feel hot. So they, you know, logically, they should know, don't, don't take those clothes off. But mm -hmm. they do. That's like a thing you see quite often, because um, you just feel hot. So anyways, back to the cosmonauts, they did, they had their cognac and I assume drinking it probably, but uh, so it was negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> they probably or, weren't like, we shouldn't drink this. We shouldn't drink this past Chev. <laughs> yeah. Negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 30 degrees Celsius. That's what that mm. is. And um, wow. Yeah. They also noted there were wolves around they were hearing. So that's not good. And they couldn't reseal the the thing, you know, the, the bolts had blown the hatch off. And so now they're you know, they're, they're just kind of, I mean, I'm sure they spent the night in the hatch, but or in the, in the little, the nature of explosive bolts. They're a one-time thing. <laughs> yeah. The other problem was, is they had actually on their way down and stuff gotten really sweaty. And they actually, uh, he said they had sweat sloshing up to their ankles, which is not good for the cold. So they did. Um, yeah. So they, he describes how they got around this problem. Uh, we had to strip naked, take off our underwear and wring the moisture out of it. We then had to pour out what liquid had accumulated in our spacesuits. We went on to separate the rigid part of the suit from its softer lining, nine layers of aluminium foil and a synthetic material called Dederone, and then put the softer part of the suits back on over our underwear and pull our boots and gloves back on. Yeah, so they, they did that and then they, you know, they spent a nice frigid night drinking cognac, presumably. Mm. And uh, so the next day, though, uh, the, the, um, some help came in the, in the form of some uh, people sent in skis. And so I don't mm -hmm. know why. It wasn't really clear. I couldn't find out why they didn't just go then with the skis to what they did the next day. But so what they did instead was build a little log cabin for some reason and, yeah. uh, and built a nice fire. And then the next day after that, another crew came and also on skis. And then, uh, yeah, they, they all traveled. It was only nine kilometers or so to an area where they could land a helicopter to come get them. Um, so I don't know, maybe they didn't have the helicopter ready or something, uh, had to bring it in. Uh, so needed just send them supplies and like stuff to keep warm and everything. But, um, yeah, I'm sure there's a, there's a good reason. Um, there had to have been a good reason, but then, so then, yeah. uh, so yeah, they go back uh, they arrived in the town of Leninsk, where they did a little, uh, you know, report to the media. And uh, Leonov just said about it. Provided with a special suit, man can survive and work in open space. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> that was it. That's all he said. <laughs> That's all he said pub publicly. I mean, uh, I, presumably he was advised not to, uh, not uh -huh. to give the details of stuff because the Soviet Union was often not so forthcoming about this, the bad stuff that happened. What? Or they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, they wanted to, you know make it look good so um yeah so that was that was their little adventure and it wasn't until much later that the, the actual details of him you know almost dying a couple times uh, came out very cool so now we're now we're moving on to why do people think the the moon was made of cheese and we'll start uh nasa in 2000 this isn't related to this previous one is it this is a whole this no is this just is like just the moon second section. you know awesome cool. uh so that. yeah so nasa in 2002 actually released the following statement Using the new camera on the recently refitted Hubble, ta Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers have been able to confirm that the moon is made of green cheese. The telling clue was the resolution of a numeric date after which the moon may go bad. Controversy still exists, however, over whether the date resolved is truly an expiration date or just a sell-by date. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bet I can guess what day they released that. <laughs> yeah, it was on April 1st of 2002. Yes, and so, but yeah, so how did this, how did this even come about? Why did people think the moon was made of cheese or where did this, this come about? So that, uh -huh. um, <laughs> this joke is so bad. Do you think it's too bad to stutter? Nah, you can tell it and then I'll make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is, that, is that original David material or did you find that somewhere? <laughs> no, that's original. <laughs> We're going to move on. You got to say it now. Come on. <laughs> no. Come on. Uh, I'm just we, can ask, just. we can ask Joel to put the, our, our producer no, to put I will the rim shot of cricket sounds. I think people can just deduce the horribleness of the joke by noting that the, the Milky Way is referenced. No, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. <laughs> this is from David. You might think that the rumor that the moon is made of green cheese got its start because it was formed in the Milky Way. This <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> Given that you write like a lot of these scripts, which are often very funny, this is uh, this is particularly I also, cheesy. I have a uh, <laughs> did, did you? Oh, did he? 
<laughs> I have a particular affinity to really, really, really bad jokes, though, as well. I just usually don't and put puns. them in the scripts. Oh, yeah, really bad puns. Love them. Um, <laughs> so I usually just You're don't put them in. You're a master of puns and good puns as well. <laughs> I usually don't put them in, though, because I know people you know, don't appreciate them as much as I do. Oh, okay. So, uh, should we, uh, should we move swiftly on? <laughs> yeah. So, so to start with, to start with, nobody actually really thought the moon was made of cheese or rather, uh, you know, no adults or whatever kids obviously did. They actually, there was a study, uh, in 1902 to I see, noticed. this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. They, they asked uh, kids, you know, what, what do you think the moon's made of? And this was in 1902. So, you know, uh, but yeah, so the, and the number one answer came back was, uh, that, that it was made of cheese. Um, so, yeah, but but they also, the other answers, this this wasn't setting the bar high, because these kids also said the other top answers, yellow paper, dead people, and rags. <laughs> what is, like, like rags, like, like you'd wipe a surface down with? I guess, I don't know. <laughs> was this, like, several children came up with the answer rags? Or oh, no, this was, like a, this was, like, a mass survey, and just to see, you know, kind of a fun uh, How? thing. How? Rat, like... It'd be like, yeah. just, it's comp- dead I understand people? like yellow paper, sure, dead but, people, why not, <laughs> heaven's up there. Bones, Rags. Yeah, I don't know. But other than the kids, other than the kids and, you know, the potential crazy person or two, uh, the, no no one actually thought the moon was made of cheese. This this uh, And another uh, common misconception, it's not actually, green doesn't signify like the color of the cheese here, obviously, because that would be weird because the moon's not green. But it actually, that just means new. That was like another way to say new cheese is sort of like before you, um, you know, press the press the whey all out or whatever, or, or wow. if the whey had been freshly pressed, but the, you know, it hasn't been aged basically. Uh, well, we so, still use that today, don't we, to say someone is green? That's true. I don't know if that's the etymology, but maybe it is. Well, it must be. But uh, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it used to just be a way to say new cheese that hadn't been aged. Um, so anyways... Going back, uh, so where did the expression come from? Why why did it become a popular thing? Because it was a very popular thing for a while. Um, and it goes all the way back to the 16th century, actually. And there's a couple mm-hmm. people that usually get cited as the originators of this thing, but they were really probably just the first people to, you know, that we have documented instance of it. So one was a French monk uh, named Francois. Francois Rabelais. Yeah, there you go. And then... Well, you're uh, welcome. Yeah. And then English writer John Haywood, who has, a, you know, a quote in English, so we're going to go with that one. So his, his, he first mentions it in the Proverbs of John Haywood, written in 1546, and you, you can go have right. fun with this one. So I had a go at doing this before we, uh, like, reading this aloud, um, before we did the episode today, and I, I, I just couldn't get it right. So I'm just going to go through, and people just, uh, because there is, like, what is a circuit quoi, quoi? Like, yeah, fetch circa qua to make me believe. I'm like, and what's sus- amazing to me this is is then we'll go in a little bit. We're going to talk about a quote that's like 80 years later or so, 90 years yeah. or so, and then it's like completely readable all of a sudden. Like, and it's like yeah. this English changed so quickly right there. Although, if you read like some sort of overly literary book or poem, mm. it's got, even today like the difference between that and like yeah. reading the Sun or like some like low brown mm-hmm. newspaper. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, you know, that's that's a yeah. It'd be like, what does that word mean? I've never heard that word before. And that sentence mm-hmm. is a paragraph long. It's like, guys, come on. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. let me try and butcher this. You fetch Sir Quique to make me believe or think, and there's an E on the end, but I'm fairly sure it's just think, yeah. that the moon is made of green cheese. And when ye have made me a lout in all these, it seemeth ye would make me go to bed at no one. That was way, way better than any of my practice. The pressure <laughs> works for me. <laughs> yeah, so uh, to translate that, uh, he's basically just saying only the extremely gullible would believe it. So it's just something that's, if someone says something so ludicrous that only someone who's really gullible will believe it, that is the whole, that is the whole um, idea behind the, mm-hmm. the phrase. It was just sort of an expression there for that. And then, so yeah, so another early example, if we go to 1565 in Shacklock's Hatchet of Heresies. Whilst they tell for truth Luther and uh, Luther his load, yes, so that they may make their blind brotherhood and the ignorant sort believe that the moon is made of green cheese. See, this one is readable, but the spelling in there is... I wish people could see what I'm trying to read right now. Yeah, it was before the standardization of the, the spelling, which is, you know, there were, they were, they weren't grammar Nazis back then. Um, like, I like that one, the, the brotherhood. <laughs> brotherhood. It sounds like <laughs> the brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. And how do you get the moon from M-O-N-E? Like, I mean, if you just sound it out, like, I guess maybe, I don't know. 
Anyway, I don't know, dude. Let's just... uh, so, so moving on to more readable uh, quotes from John Wilkins' mm-hmm. New World Book uh, One, which he makes it explicitly clear the the meaning of the expression and and that it actually was now very common. You may as soon persuade some country peasants that the moon is made of green cheese, as we say, as that tis bigger than his cartwheel. See, that's all completely normal. The spelling's yeah. been standardized. <laughs> it's all very readable. And so, yeah, this was just a way to signify gullibility. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and uh, in more recent times, people started to actually believe that people used to think this, which is pretty ironic, actually. It's like the world is flat thing, right? Did we mention that? Because this is one yeah, of my yeah, favorite yeah. ones. Yeah, this is yeah. exactly. So people, uh, I was even taught this in, in like grade school and stuff that people used to it was, think. It was this huge thing. Like, yeah, Christopher yeah. Columbus, he thought he could fall off the side of the world. It's yeah, like, and everyone was no, like, no, no. Yeah, no, no one thought that really. It was just, this was, it had been, it's been a couple uh, millennia that people have known that they're commonly known that the world was round. And in fact, Eratosthenes, uh, he he was the, the head librarian at the Library of Alexandria in 240 BC or so, and he actually calculated within two percent accuracy the circumference of the Earth all the way back this then. Is amazing! It totally. This guy was amazing. Like he he was incredible. He also did uh, so. He calculated the distance from the Earth to the Sun and was only off by about a half a percent on his measurement. Amazing! Which is crazy. Uh, calculated the tilt of the Earth on its axis. Two two thousand two hundred and sixty years ago. Yeah, yeah. And the tilt of the Earth on its axis was only off by a half a degree, which is also crazy. And uh, yeah, he's also the uh, father of geography, generally considered, because he he wrote quite a lot of works on geography. You know what's even more impressive about that? I bet if you ask someone, like, is the Earth straight or on a tilt? I think you'd get like a 50-50 response of like, sure or no. Because you always look at those maps of the solar system, it's always like nice and straight, but it is tilted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was kind of funny, though, so as, as impressive as he is, uh, a lot of his work, unfortunately, is lost and everything, but uh, we have references, you know, to a lot of mm-hmm. it. Uh, but it, he was known as to be second best at everything. But oh. <laughs> was sort of his, his thing is he was like a preeminent mind, but like ever, there was always someone who was better at each field, like, you know, that he would try at. That was kind of the a kind of a reference to him. It was kind of funny, I thought. Uh, well, this, I feel that's kind of the nature of, of the Renaissance man, right? Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, true. True, he's just he's good at a lot of things. But anyways, so speaking of the moon, going back to the space, mm-hmm. which is the whole thing. So the United States at one point, this is absolutely true. I didn't know this. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> on nuking the moon. Yeah. Not completely. Just just putting a nuke up there and just let's hit it with a nuke. Let's see what happens. And the more amazing thing is the reason for doing it. It's kind of like that is you you hear that and you're like, oh, there must have been some proper reason for them doing this right but it's not at all no it was just because we can yes basically and we can and you know it's something we can do to maybe make it look like hey we hit the moon with something we're ahead of the soviet union you know we did something you know they haven't sent something to the moon and we'll make it a they haven't they haven't nuked the moon yeah (laughs) yeah and that's also you know we're sending a nuclear bomb like that's you know pretty awesome too and (laughs) they specifically wanted a nuclear bomb because they wanted it to be able to visible they wanted the the explosion and the dust cloud Mm -hmm. however to be visible from earth and so they also wanted it um on that on that note they wanted it to be kind of at the edge of where the moon kind of like you know so you could kind of see on the edge this sort of cloud going up instead of like straight on so where the yeah. sun's hitting, so it would be very visible from Earth. This is what they're going. It was called a study of lunar research flights, or Project A one one nine, and it was in the late nineteen fifties. The the uh, the U.S. was was planning on doing this or thinking about it. It makes me wonder what all the the other one hundred and eighteen projects were. Like, yeah, they had, well, they had so many crazy crazy projects Dude. around this time. It was it was pretty fun. Um, but I feel like America, like not just with the space race, but with the communists and the CIA, had some pretty wild times in the nineteen fifties and sixties. Totally, yeah. Things were pretty intense for a while. Yeah, like the Project McCultra, which is no one's thought that one's like. Where is they that were the LSD liter- one? Yeah, they were literally giving people, random people, LSD just to see what happened without them knowing. Just random citizens. Just like, here, here. Yep. We'll just slip them some LSD. Let's see what happens. And Weren't this- they kidnapping them from brothels or like trapping them yeah, in brothels? Yeah, they did stuff something? like that. Some people got, some people died as a result. It wasn't, it wasn't like awesome. Not a, not a, not a bright spot in the history of the CIA's. Yeah, uh, it was this. Was the CIA leading this, or the precursor to the CIA? Yeah, um, this this in general wasn't like. A, I feel like the Cold War with the CIA was not a time of like m- they weren't really following the rules so much, just no. doing kind of whatever they wanted. Although people are going to look back on those Snowden leaks, like in the future, and be like, "Whoa, 
Yeah. Like even now I feel that that is underplayed, like quite how serious that was. Yeah. Like yeah. just the level of spying. Well, a lot of, the, I guess, yeah. When you're, when is the time, like, especially if you're in that time, you're like, well, well it is the cold war. We don't want to get nuked. Like we want yeah. them to be able to have these extra powers to do stuff. And you know, there's probably some element of truth to that anyway, but um, anyways, back to nuking the moon. Uh, yeah. So they have uh, back to the important stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, Leonard Raphael. I say a ri- rifle. <laughs> rifle? Le- yeah. Leonard, Leonard rifle. W- would you say Leonard or Leonard? Dude, I don't know. I was just making fun. I, I, <laughs> I just, because he, inve- he, he, uh, he came up with the idea of the, the missile to do it, right? So it yeah, it's funny a, if his name was Rifle. So he was, he was put in charge. <laughs> that, that's true. So he was put in charge of the, the whole thing. And uh, he thought it would be quite easy, actually, take an intercontinental uh, ballistic missile and just mm-hmm. shoot it yeah. off there. Wouldn't be that hard to do. Um, and they thought he could hit it with about an accuracy of about two miles, which also demonstrated sort of something the U.S. could shoot and hit a target that small, that far away. Like, that's going to make the Soviets nervous. It's pretty um, impressive. Yeah, that would be impressive, but they didn't think it would be that hard. And actually, a little aside here, Carl Sagan, everybody knows Carl Sagan, mm-hmm. I feel like, or at least has heard of him. He was actually, this was, he was a quite young, young scientist, just budding, just getting his start. And he got mm-hmm. hired on for this project. And his job was to study how the cloud would, would sort of form. Cause you know, like on, on earth, it would be like a mushroom cloud, but how would it form, you know, without air and without the, you know, all that, what, what would it look like? And so, yeah, it was basically his job to figure out what it would look like, how big the cloud would be and stuff like that. And, uh, and make sure that they, that it would, you know, be visible from earth which was kind of the whole point as the demonstration specifically russia <laughs> yeah they wanted they wanted to make sure everyone could know we 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 nuked the moon um so yeah they uh, so he he Sagan actually proposed that this was actually have a lot of scientific merit too it wouldn't just be because they could the cloud you have the cloud with the sun illuminating you could learn a lot about the moon's composition um doing spectral analysis and stuff like that so he thought this was this was actually a great idea for science Always good in, for science to blow things up anyway. So, yeah, uh, but the, uh, unfortunately, when, when the plan got all hashed out, they decided not to do it because, you know, the world in general might not respond favorably to the U.S. nuking the moon. So they ran it through. It was like the engineers said yes, the scientists said yes. They ran it through like public mm-hmm. relations and they were like, mm, mm-hmm. probably not, guys. Yeah, yeah like veto yeah, this one. Pretty cool, but also, yeah, yeah people aren't going to be happy about that. N- nice idea. However, <laughs> but the, the U.S. was like, well, if we can't nuke the moon, we should at least mm-hmm. nuke something in space. you got to nuke something. Which brings us around to Britain. <laughs> so, oh. so people, people don't, you know, Britain's not really a space powerhouse. I was going to no, say, people, we have yeah. stuff in space. Yeah, yeah. And, and nobody, nobody really thinks. But in fact, Britain was the third country to have a satellite operating in space. Um, really? Which, yes, yes. Wow. Now, it, was, it was with... Go the, Britain! Yeah, so, so, what, so what happened was the U.S. Uh, kind of announced around the same time they were planning on nuking the moon that if any countries wanted to put something in space, they would happily, you know, help out. The U.S. would, would help them launch it and everything. And so, so Britain uh, took them up That's on the offer. Generous. Yeah, the Britain was like, all right, we'll design a satellite to, to study the ionosphere. Um, so they, you know, they ended up pretty quickly hashing out the plan. Are you guys going to blow this up? Yeah. <laughs> what? We're what? gonna spend a few years building this satellite, so you know, make sure you don't blow it up. Uh, and so instead, uh, and so the the plan got uh, got pushed through the U.S. You know, yeah. didn't get along well, and so they uh, they do spend a few years designing this satellite. They send it over to the U.S. The U.S. plops it in their little Thor Delta rocket and makes the little uh, you know greatest name for a rocket ever, by the way. Yeah, Thor Delta. Yeah, and so they launch it into space and uh, on the uh-huh. aerial one was what the satellite was called was aerial one and so in 1959 then this is again not long after the u.s uh, decided not to nuke the moon for some reason mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so it's up there it's operating you know quite nicely everything is checking out and then then they start uh, they start getting weird readings from it and so it turns out not not long after after they sent it up the u.s decided to to launch a nuke into space and you know just to um, again, kind of just see what would happen. Oh, I should go back to what that, maybe I should say what the Arrow one was supposed to do. So it had, you know, like a tape recorder and sending stuff. And it was, it was trying to basically look at the ionosphere and how it worked. Cause there, there wasn't really a lot of hard data and stuff. I mean, obviously they had ideas and stuff, but they really wanted to see, you know, up close and personal, get sensor readings and everything of, of how it worked, um, and everything. So it's, it's working nicely. And then, and then all of a sudden it stops working uh-huh. and they're like, what, what happened here? And so it turns out the U.S. Uh, decided to 
to send a 1.4 megaton nuclear weapon named Starfish Prime to the upper atmosphere. People a, were just better at naming stuff in the past. It was, and who named what? these military things? Because, they, they, you know, did they have like a round table? Like, how does this, or is it just like the commanding officer of some thing is like Starfish Prime? That's awesome. I like to think they have like a general in, you know, in those movies, they have like the bunker underneath the White House where they all like <laughs> sit around really serious. And then you've got the kind of guy who's like, I don't know, his dad like contributed 10 million to their cam- someone's campaign. <laughs> and so they made him like a four star general. He's just sitting in the corner and they just give him the job of coming up with names to stuff. So everyone's like, OK, we're going to launch it at this date. Jeff, Jeff, what should we call it? <laughs> hmm. Stoppage Prime. <laughs> yeah. And then and the, the whole operation was called uh, Project Fishbowl. Um, which oh my is, God, wow. uh, yeah, the Earth, I guess. Go. I suppose that one's the Earth. This is the fishbowl, and they're going to send up a nuke and explode it. For Delta! Now, to, to be fair to the U.S. scientists, they didn't launch, they didn't explode the nuke near near the Aerial 1 satellite. It just turns out that the shock wave, the wave of radiation and all that that went around the Earth uh, was was sufficient enough to knock out the, the Aerial 1 and pretty much every other satellite in orbit at the well time. Done. It is a nuclear bomb. Yeah, but but it was like they, to be fair, it was like on the other side of the planet at the time. Uh, so they didn't, they just didn't quite adequately uh, get the extent of what of the of the wave of radiation and stuff that would go around. And they knocked out. Um, see what was it? One third of all the satellites in low Earth orbit at the time. Wow. <laughs> yeah, um, and also this uh, most famously was the Telstar satellite, which was the first commercial communication relay satellite. And this, the Telstar, wasn't even in orbit at the time of the explosion. This had the, the, it just had the residual effects of this blast. So it, it got launched a little bit after that and put in orbit. And then, um, yeah, so, but the, the extra radiation and all that took mm-hmm. um, quite a long time to dissipate. And the, the people who designed the Telstar satellite hadn't accounted for this extra radiation and stuff. And so a lot of the transistors and stuff went out on the command system, and then it just stopped working, uh, I think, within a few months or something like that. Uh, just kind of systems degraded, and that was that was done, that yeah. satellite. So, yeah, even after, even after they were still affecting uh, stuff that went up later. They were complaining about that Starfish Prime detonation for years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Starfish Prime. And so, and this wasn't even, the, the Starfish Prime one wasn't, the, the explosion wasn't even the first, they had actually tried to, to nuke in space send a nuke up in space before um but the the rocket actually failed and when the rocket failed it has a self-destruct on it Uh so automatically so it would get rid of the you know explode the nuclear warhead without actually you know detonating the the nuclear part of it um Mm -hmm. so yeah so but the problem was this then just rained down radioactive stuff on the um the johnson and sand islands there near uh not that far from the hawaiian islands so Uh not good and and uh, they knocked out some 900 or so miles away from the blast of the of the actual you know nuclear explosion that went up. The electromagnetic pulse knocked out um, all the lights, the street lights, and the telephone system uh, in Hawaii. Uh, which can you imagine that today? So like back then, there wasn't like a ton of electronic systems. I was all just over. thinking that would wreck everything, right? Yeah, 900 or so miles away from the explosion, and just like that electromagnetic pulse just took out all the electrical <laughs> stuff. And so yeah, today that would be. That would be quite devastating, actually. Um, cause a lot of damage. So yeah, that wasn't a good idea, as it turns out. But speaking of dropping nuclear material on things when you don't mean to, uh, mm-hmm. so did you know that the U.S. once dropped not one, not two, not three, but four nuclear bombs on Spain? Did not know that. Yeah, accidentally, uh, of course. I'm assuming they didn't go off, because I feel like <laughs> I would know that if they did. No, they luckily did not go off, although they did spread a lot of, uh, I mean, the, the, well, I'll get into it in a minute. So, so how did this happen? What, I mean, this uh-huh. was an accident, clearly. They weren't trying to nuke Spain <laughs> randomly. Um, so the, like, who so, should we provoke now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just Spanish. A, it was just a show like the Soviet Union. Hey, we even, we even nuke our sort of allies. So you just better watch out. Let this be a lesson to you. <laughs> yeah. So there was a B-52G bomber, which was holding the the four nukes uh 70 kiloton nukes um so yeah and um, and it was getting refueled by the kc-135 strata tanker and it mm-hmm. turns out uh, they they collided in midair the, the two um planes collided and uh you know went down and in the process all the nukes also got ejected this is very like casual just well we were refueling there was a crash all of the nukes well yeah and that they have a person who's watching out 
for, for if the planes are getting too close and it's like manually. So it's not even like sensors. There's like literally physically watching the planes, make sure they're keeping their distance. And for some reason, that person never, never, there's no record of them ever giving any warning that the planes were suddenly getting close and, uh, and then they collide too or too close and then they collided. And he was never heard from again. <laughs> no, he was not. Um, <laughs> it's like, and that's where the historical record ends. Yeah. So they do know three of the three of the nukes fell uh, mm-hmm. near the village of pa- Palemare, Spain. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, and the fourth one, the the parachute for some reason de- deployed. So maybe it was like an automatic, but I don't know why the other three didn't. So parachute deployed. So then it floated off and found its way into the Mediterranean, not not too far away. Um, which was a problem later. Uh, but so the three that fell near the near the village uh, ended up, um, let's see. So two of them actually had, they have these explosive igniters that actually are supposed to, you know, force the, I don't know what type of nukes they were, if they're the ones like the ramming ones or whatever, but they're, mm-hmm. you know, they're supposed to you know, ignite the nuclear explosion or whatever, but they, I mean, it wasn't in the armed position or whatever. I don't know what kind it was, but Either way, they, yeah, good. The igniters did go off. The, that part of the explosion did go off, but it did not, uh, you know, uh, generate the chain reaction for the nuke to then go off. Um, but yeah, but the, what it did do is spread nuclear material all over the place uh, within good. within a few mile radius, which wasn't good because it was near a village, and that caused a lot of problems. The third one landed in a um, in a riverbed, so it didn't the, the explosive didn't go off, so it was quite intact. And I might point out here. That these things were estimated to cost two billion dollars a piece, which is about fifteen billion dollars a day each one. Good Th- lord! This was an expensive wreck, and so yeah, the how other many one- of them were there? Three, four, four total. That's like yeah, so, sixty billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, a lot. And uh, so the fourth one, I even the- know, that's a lot. Of, I know military spending is high. Yeah, but that is a lot. Well, back then they could, you know, they had kind of unlimited budget because it was the Cold War. So. You know. Yeah, but I mean, there's still like yeah. GDP to consider, and I'm sure that was like, yeah, that's not nothing. Yeah, so that's yeah, like the, a good number of hospitals. The fourth one was problem because yes. it landed in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, and so where? How do you find this thing? Because they need to recover it. Obviously, they can't just leave a nuke lying around somewhere. Um, so they end up. Uh, luckily, uh, Francisco Simo Orts, he was a fisherman. Uh, he saw mm-hmm. kind of roughly where it hit, and so he helped the military kind of locate that area. And then they did lots of dives and stuff. And it took them; it actually took them quite a while to f- actually find it under the water. But they did find it eventually. And this is great the the Simo Orts guy. He, you know, they have salvage rights if you're the, if you're the locator of something. And he sort mm-hmm. of located it because he saw where it hit the water. And if not for him, they would have really uh, had trouble finding it. And so he claimed that he deserved the the traditional one to two percent uh, salvage rights fee. And he hired that's a lawyer. Amazing. And this, this, I mean, at the 1% is like $20 million, obviously. And so that's yeah. about $153 million today. And so that's what he said the U.S. owed him. And, uh, and so, yeah, by the Secretary of Defense's own valuation of the nukes, was the, that's where the $2 billion figure came. Um, kind so, of fair. Yeah, I mean. Like, I know it's crazy, but it's kind of. Yeah, I mean, like, he, didn't, I get it. he didn't technically find it, but find they wouldn't it, have right. found it without him. So that was true. Uh, so yeah, so he claimed it, hired a lawyer. They did settle out of court, not known how much he got, but I'm sure he got a lot. Oh yeah. If he was going after 153 million. And I feel like, I feel like if someone's saying like, I'm going after 153 million, it's like, yeah, but you just got burned from your coffee. Everyone's like, that's never going to happen. I don't know, that's yeah. ridiculous. But I look at this and I'm like, well, I can kind of see that. Well, so yeah, he's getting paid. The U.S. military is probably eager not to have this be like a lengthy court battle that keeps in the press. Like, oh, yeah, we accidentally dropped a bunch of nukes that are worth Remember a lot of money. Remember how badly we screwed up, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just spent like $60 billion on nothing and lots of, and what was it, like, a you know, six to ten people or something died in the process. Um, and we spread nuclear, nuclear waste all over near this town in Spain. So. Yeah, one of our allies. Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, so they, you know, they probably were just like, yeah, give him whatever, we'll go away. But anyways, so the the other reason this is noteworthy is that there was a guy named Carl Brashear, and he, mm-hmm. he in the process, he was a diver, and in the process of trying to get the, the nuke, recover it, he ended up losing his leg uh, oh. in an accident. It got crushed. And, like uh, in why, a dive? Uh, yeah, I assume so. Wow. But uh, yeah, so not anyways, the, the point being that if you've ever seen the movie Men of Honor, this was one of the uh, partial inspirations for that movie. I have not, but that's quite a cast. Cuba Gooding Jr., Robert De Niro, Charlie yeah. Theron. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. The time the US nuked Spain. That would be a very clickable video title. Yeah, I don't know why we haven't done that one yet. So speaking of the uh, the US detonating nukes in the upper atmosphere, so um so you might people might be going, So what what was the point? So I kinda said it was just kind of because and it was kinda just because, uh mostly. But the uh, there was sort of 
uh, some thinking behind it. So there's this uh, there's this uh, history professor James Fleming, and so he kind of combed through these top secret files to you know now that are released in public, and to look yeah. at what, what what were they doing, you know. And it turns out. So you have you ever heard of the Van Allen belts? Uh, the, on those those vaguely uh, radiation belts. That loop. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So he announces to the world he discovers these these things. Um, yeah, the radiation belts around the Earth. Mm-hmm. And so at the very same day he announces this, he also proposes to the military that we should we should nuke it. We should nuke these radiation belts just to see what would happen. And so then the, the Professor Fleming actually had a, I, he had a kind of a funny quote about this. Uh, he said, This is the first occasion I've ever discovered where someone discovered something and immediately decided to blow it up. <laughs> For science. For science. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, that was not part of his quote. That was yeah. us adding. <laughs> yeah. And That'd this is awesome. Because again, scientists like to blow stuff up. Uh, the, and when when you're Britain at this point, I don't think Britain had nukes at this point, did they? Uh, Early 1960s. I don't actually know. Yeah, um, so, but but so even if they did, they, they didn't weren't so uh, audacious to to maybe waste the money detonating them. But they still like to blow stuff up. So that the British did actually uh, attach grenades to suborbital rockets uh, to to explode them in the atmosphere, also just to see what would happen. So you know they use what they got, the explosions they have on hand. That's that's pretty crazy. I'm just fascinated by, yeah, sixty billion is a lot of money. Because yeah. I just look if that was the UK today, the the GDP of the UK is two point six trillion dollars, and I'm like, so that's zero point zero six. That's not like it. That's like mm-hmm. point nearly point one percent if you're rounding mm-hmm. up of mm-hmm. the entire GDP of the country on four bombs. Granted, it was America. Your GDP is going to be a lot higher, yeah, yeah. but. That's a lot of money. Yeah, totally. But yeah, scientists, they like to blow stuff up. So They love yeah. blowing stuff up. Yeah. Actually, Everything in college. By this episode. <laughs> I did in college. Um, so I was in, uh, I don't know, it was special relativity or something like that. Um, uh, with uh, I had a lot of courses with this one professor. I really liked the, she was a um, physics professor and all that, all the higher level ones. So really good teacher. But anyways, yeah. the point being, so we go into class one day and, and we're, you know, thinking we're going to, you know, learn about, you know something cool like uh which special relativity if you ever that that class or like a cosmology or something blows your mind like every day like every lecture is just like whoa that's amazing but anyways this one literally blew our minds because she said this video brought to you by skillshare (laughs) (laughs) she said she said no i've canceled my lecture today i've just found out we're blowing stuff up outside, so let's go. I'll do that. And so we go, and there's some other class. They had decided, for reasons unknown, uh, this this I think it was a graduate level class too, where they had these fifty gallon drums of water. Which what is that? What is that like? Four five hundred pounds. Well, I was thinking like the weight four five hundred pounds maybe oh, or something. Um, um, and that's probably more than that in liters. How much was it? You say? Uh, fifty gallon drums of water. Fifty gallons in pounds is oh i need to choose my uh substance <laughs> of course and for some reason i've been linked to a youtube video i'm gonna uh, guess let's 280 <laughs> what do you think 280 or something anyway okay the point being for some reason they'd put explosives underneath these 50 gallon drums of water and were launching them to see how high they could launch them in the air for science what? i guess i don't and where know do you get explosives that can do that i don't that, that's a lot of weight and they kept they had like a series of progressive ones to see you know who could get higher or whatever but it was it was it was all good fun and that's what we did that class so just wow. scientists love to blow stuff up was the point of that yeah i remember there was uh this is less exciting after your example but when i was uh, at high school equivalent of high school and there was um we'd have chemistry class you know the alkali metal so you've got like your lithium <laughs> your sodium your potassium your uh cesium francium the other ones whatever they are and there was only like you could get them for the labs in the school but you could only mm-hmm. get potassium that was the highest uh, up the reactive alkali mm-hmm. met- metals you could get so my chemistry teacher he was like i just bought a massive one so normally you get these little pea sized <laughs> yeah. bits. Yeah. So he had something that was like the size of a fist. <laughs> and he like takes it out of the oil or whatever. The, you keep it and he's like, we should go outside. So he gets like an ice cream tub, fills it up with water. And it's like pouring with rain outside. And he gets, gets one of the kids. He's like, put on these safety goggles. Put on this like uh <laughs> You'll be <leather."> fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, go throw it into the thing. And he misses and it rolls along the wet, the wet, uh, like... um 
the the tiles or whatever mm-hmm. outside because it was raining and it's like fizzing and the kid just grabs it he just runs oh, no. in, grabs it and dumps it in the water and it's just yeah. it was great one of the highlights of my schooling so yeah, yeah blowing stuff up good good fun we had in high school too i had uh, we had took like sodium or something I mean, we didn't get to handle it of course uh, they weren't so brave our teacher was not so brave i'm not sure that was that was allowed yeah <laughs> But yeah, we did get to watch it go boom, um, which yeah, was fun. It's a good time. Yeah. There's some great YouTube videos of that happening. There's one from like the 90s or whatever. And it's like, oh, rubidium is the one that's after potassium. And then I think they get radioactive. <laughs> and then he's like putting the potassium in. It's like, <laughs> and then he puts rubidium in it and it completely it shatters the glass <laughs> that is protect the, the like the safety glass. And it's <laughs> like, whoa, it was cool. Yeah. Check the video out. That is the, that's the space talk for today um i did want to i actually did want to say you had a, t- a tweet uh, on, on twitter there naturally uh where you you talk about so we were talking about last episode or the one before about how the apollo mission uh, how they they're really inappropriate if you go read the transcripts they're oh, just yeah. bad language and you had a great quote that you found on one of them well i was just on holiday for two weeks so i downloaded a bunch of these i, I made a mistake at first because they have them all on the nasa website or whatever mm-hmm. uh, and these these are the transcripts of what the astronauts are saying to most of them are communicating with capcom so it's them kind of talking about pretty standard things like we need to release the valve valve released blah yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. but the ones that are kind of like exciting are the ones where it's just them in the cockpit mm-hmm. so it's not them talking with capcom it's just the astronauts bantering with each other and i read a bunch of these so uh producer joel you might want to bleep some of these out i'm just going to read it as it is <laughs> so this is oh i didn't write down which one it was but it was on one of the apollo missions and the dude says oh you stupid son of a bitch. god damn these things are really about to piss me off i get that suck her open and the son of a bitch shuts up again and um i really spend more f-ing time trying to put goddamn water bags together than anything else <laughs> this is amazing and the more amazing thing is i wrote this in my tweet they don't say f-ing. uh this is going to sound really weird they don't say the f because it's all bleeped out i guess you don't they don't say the f word they change it to it's not fracking it's uh, uh freaking i think is they freaking yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they added it for the transcript yeah yeah. And I was like, is that really what's going on? So I Googled it and uh, someone's like, oh no, just the transcriptionist at NASA. Uh, yeah, she was trying to keep things clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although I think sucker. That's, <laughs> yes. that's an answer I haven't heard in a long time. And he's just calling an inanimate object a sucker. It's pretty funny. This is, this is the thing when I was reading through those ones, those many hundreds, a uh, couple hundred pages there, it was just like, they're doing this all the time. They're just like so oh, yeah. inappropriate constantly and so, you know, bad language. And it's just, it's such a different, because, you know, you see them in the, in the media reels and on their interviews and they're just like, the prim and proper, like, uh, you know, like G willikers. And, you know, <laughs> but if they're kind of like, they're, they're like Air Force flyboys, right? Like, yeah. they're more like your Top Gun people rather than your scientists. Yeah, they're totally the Top Gun. Like, uh, you have the, that, that uh, we've got that one video, the Don Draper of the Skies. Oh, uh, where Because the, they were all... Don, with Alan Shepard. Yeah, they were all basically when they were in training, to, to sum up when they were in training. So they had their wives and their prim and proper thing back home that they all, everything was above board, looked really good to the media. <laughs> and then they you would get them on their <laughs> own. Animals in yeah. the training, and they were just sleeping with everyone who walked, and um, and just <laughs> awful. Uh, the whole just yeah, the Don Draper. Alan, Alan Shepard is an absolute. Alan Shepard was like the worst, except for uh, so what was it? Um, who's the old guy that went? Uh, Glenn. Uh, I know who you mean. Um, the guy who went to space like way later when he was older, or are we talking about someone else? John Glenn. There we go. John Glenn. Okay. Yeah. So John Glenn was actually one of them that he was actually sort of the, the, what was presented more on the, on the, to the media. And he, he had a lot of problems with Alan Shepard and the others and trying to get everyone else to behave because they were constantly just doing stuff that if the media ever found out, like the space program would just be shot because there was already a lot of controversy. This is one of the contrary to popular belief is like the, you know, you know, the greatest generation we went, we sent, you know, these people to the moon and all this. And it turns out American, America at the time really was largely the polls say against the space program at all and the tax funding. It's for a lot it. of money, right? Yeah. Yeah. As similar to today where it's just like, yeah, it's too much money. It's a waste of money. And this is kind of was the general consensus at the time. 
it was more the U.S. just doing it to show off, basically. Uh, anyway, the government was doing it anyway, despite the populists. So, um, so yeah, so it was uh, sort of tenuous. And if a lot of the stuff the astronauts were doing would get out, especially like 1960s sensibilities, uh, mm-hmm. it, it would have been it would have been a bad time for the space program. So he was he was trying to like, hey, guys, let's we got to We got to shape up, you know, like not do this stuff all the time. Um, but and they were like, yeah, I, I do no, feel like we're just going to do what we want because <laughs> Didn't the public know who these guys were? I mean, you can present whatever image you want to the media, but this was the 1960s. These were yeah. kind of like, I, you know, I feel like M- Mad Men is a nice, is an interesting look into that generation of like what men were like, yeah. especially powerful men. And these guys yeah. were kind of powerful heroes. Well, yeah. And, and, what, what, and it was, <laughs> what I mean, really think was up. You, re- you look at some of the quotes of like their wives, what did they think? And it was basically like, yeah, when you're away, but when you're back home. You you yeah. do not do any of these things. You are the prim and proper person, you know, like, uh, and that was kind of the the general consensus there. Um, which, by the yeah. way, uh, oh maybe I'll leave this for the bonus fact. There's a there's an uh, there's a fun bonus fact with uh, it might have even been John Glenn. Are uh, we doing bonus facts today, or did we wrap up these? Is that another another episode? We got uh, tons of bonus facts, and that's probably going to be the next couple episodes. Is just bonus facts, or maybe just a really long bonus fact? But I, it might have been John Glenn and his wife. They have a, it's a fun. One of the astronauts, anyway. It's a fun, okay. fun story. I'm gonna, I'll put it in the bonus facts. Okay, I've got some follow up, more follow up. Have you got okay. other follow ups you want to do? No, no, that's all I got. I, I got a couple. Okay, so I was saying about the the freezing in space, right, and how it's cold. Mm-hmm. And I said I had an amazing, like, it's entertaining. It's not useful at all, but it mm-hmm. is. It, it was just so appropriate. So I've just been on holiday for a couple of weeks, and uh, my, well, now my wife and I, we have like a, mm-hmm. a bit of a tradition. Like, you know, if there's good internet, we'll watch it, like a Netflix movie or whatever in the evening. And normally what we do is we first go through every Nicolas Cage movie that's come out. So Nicolas Cage makes a lot of movies because he owes a lot of people a lot of money. So he makes a lot of bad movies and a lot of them get, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot on Netflix. So we're like, watch these bad movies. And we don't always make it through, but it's just kind of like a fun thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then somehow my recommendation engine gets a bit weird. And so I got something called the Cloverfield Paradox. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard of this. I've no, never heard of this movie. It's just like a... It, I think it's actually, it was, I think J.J. Abrams produced it, but it had kind of, really? a, bit of a B B movie feel. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's this, they're in space, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Uh, so they're in space and a woman gets trapped in an airlock. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then it starts filling with water because obviously there's some water running past the airlock. Oh, right. It's already stupid. <laughs> and we're in an airlock, right? So the water's pouring into the airlock and it's filling up with water. Mm-hmm. The first problem is, how does that possibly work? Air pressure is a thing. Yeah. That water's yeah. not going to come in or something terrible is going to happen to her as the pressure increases. Mm-hmm. Um, but secondly, that's all fine. Let's just theoretically go with that. So it fills up and then the outside hatch blows off. Mm-hmm. So, and instantly, everything freezes. Mm-hmm. Like, the all, all it's a big airlock. All of the water is just flash frozen in an instant and mm-hmm. she's just frozen in the ice looking through and i'm like we just talked about it that is so dumb and i'm just like that yeah, would not happen that, i wonder what in that so it would probably just like get gaseous state real quick i mean there would be like a drop but it wouldn't yeah it would just be like whoosh, probably it just even if it was absolute zero outside yeah no i i'm I, no, pretty sure it no. would just because all the all the molecules would instantly just like want to spread apart and in their little gaseous state so yeah yeah, yeah, no. I watched that and I was like, mm, 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 mm. But, <laughs> yeah. And I watch more Nick Nicholas Cage. <laughs> just had to feel like, yeah, yeah. Nicholas Cage wasn't in this movie. It was just, I think, recommended from like. Have we done that? Have we done that one on? Uh, I don't think we about have his on the... dinosaur skull. Yeah, about his spending no, habits. Story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nuts. Absolutely just nuts. Buying everything in sight and just spending money on whatever. He even had uh, at one point like a car in his house, and it wasn't really clear how he got it. Like it probably had to take down the wall of the house to get the car in that, and then put the wall back up, or I or build or this... take the par- car apart and have someone build it inside. One of the other happened. And he just, he, he would have it there. Like, this was in, in your article, so I'm sure you know this. I just read it because it was a good one. Like, yeah. We've not made it yet, but I was like, this is, I think I just came across it. Yeah. And it's just, he would have these absolutely wild Gatsby style parties. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, Nick Cage. Yeah. And this is yeah. why he's in every movie. Uh, yeah. That, you every, know, any movie that they'll pay him. And this is the thing Nicolas Cage is a good actor. Nicolas mm-hmm. Cage has done great movies and he can clearly act. 
I think once he kind of gets his shit together, he's going to have like a resurgence. I'm waiting for the day when Nicolas Cage does good movies. Well, again. he did when he when he finally got, you know, hit rock bottom there with his finances. He did sort of like, but he's still now he's just more moderated, but still like he still likes his comic book conventions. And uh, which actually, yeah. if you go, apparently a lot of the comic book conventions, he's a huge comic book fan. You'll find him there mm-hmm. and uh, he buys wow. expensive comics. Yeah. There you go. He's spending his money. Yeah. Spending his money. Look forward to that uh, video at some point because that that is an interesting one. There's dinosaur skulls in there as well. Yeah. How could you? How could you not love that? Yeah. I want to do some reviews, uh, just because it's good too, and to give back, and it's nice to, that people leave us reviews. Then I've got something amazing to share. Okay. And not just with you, but with a whole audience, because oh. it's it's the, possibly my favorite thing that's happened to me this year. Oh really? Um, well, oh that's, yeah. I, well, oh yeah. You know what this is, I think. Okay. I, or, unless you haven't been through all the emails, like, I send you a huge number of emails, so maybe you haven't seen it yet. It's amazing. All right. Um, all right. I give you clues to do with Vladimir Putin. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know what it is, right? It's yeah. amazing. I was I was going to say though. Now, does Dami listen to these podcasts? Because that quote, just admit, you might want to cut that out. <laughs> Wait, which quote? The one where you said it was the most oh, amazing the thing that ah, happened yeah. to you all year. <laughs> Let's just say it's the most amazing work. Come on, it's been like Domi, two weeks. <laughs> Domi is the woman who became my wife uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. I really should say work thing. <laughs> Yes. Uh, no. Uh, let's let's move swiftly on. But it is amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. Uh, okay. I want to thank. Uh, we've had a bunch of five star reviews, which is always nice. Uh, and like I said at the beginning of the, episode, of the episode, if you jump on over to wherever you listen to your podcasts, leave us a review. When we hit 200 reviews on iTunes, just because I don't want to add up all the number of reviews from different platforms, we're going to pick someone at random from all of the platforms like Stitcher, Podbean, Podcast Addict, uh, iTunes, Casper. Android, Casper. Android's an operating system, not a podcast <laughs> platform. Uh, let's do those things. Uh, we'll pick someone at random and give them a gift voucher on Amazon and two other people will get uh, runner-up vouchers of 50 bucks each. Uh, North Fallen. I'm not really a podcast person, but S&D, uh, Simon and Davin, I'm going to guess, rather than supply and demand, <laughs> have great chemistry and make this show so relaxing. I feel like I'm sitting down at the bar with some friends for Trivia Night. You know you would win with them on your team. I'm surprisingly terrible at pub quizzes, just because really? you think like, oh, Simon must be really good at this, but then it's like, Especially in the UK, because they'll be like, in EastEnders, which is like a UK uh, soap, who yeah. was married to this person? I'm like, no idea. And then it's like, which team won the World Cup in 1996? And yeah. I'm like, no idea. And so I'm surprisingly <laughs> useless at this, this stuff. Is, this is the thing. I am great at Trivial Pursuit, like the standard one, you know? Yeah. But if you get like the, you know, the entertainment one or whatever, I'm, I know nothing. I am absolutely nothing. It's like Kim Kardashian's sister <laughs> is no yeah, idea. Like pop culture ones. It's just unless I mean, if it's to do with music, maybe I'd, I'd hit that. But anything else, it's not. Yeah, I'm not going to get that. Yeah. So sorry, North Fallen. Uh, don't don't pick me for your pub quiz. Yeah. Brad and Dan- Danielle Tien say I discovered today. I found that back in 2013. Wow. There you go. That was before we wow. knew each other. Wow. And I've been watching Simon on top tens for about two years now. I found the podcast when someone Simon plugged it on YouTube. I, w- I was super happy when I learned that you two knew each other. Uh, also, they don't know that we have a YouTube channel together. Oh. We also have that. <laughs> that you two know each other. Love the podcast and love you guys. I'm probably in the minority, but I enjoyed the longer format of the mm. podcast better. Still, though, five out of five. There you go. Mm, awesome. Should I do one more or should we wrap it up there? What do you think? Uh, do you want to do a couple on the social media? Because we do have that brain food show um, thing. Always, always. I feel like by having this at the end, we have a bit more flexibility. Because if people don't like this, they can just turn, turn off. It off. <laughs> but they are waiting for that cliffhanger of a, what's your favorite thing that's happened to you all year that's, you know, not dummy. Well, did I, did I do that on purpose? I might have done that on purpose. <laughs> uh, Shannon Brinton says uh, on Twitter... Uh, someone uh, told myself I wasn't going to get into podcasts, but I failed due to hashtag Brain Food Show. Love the interesting history ones. I'm particularly fond of the Julius Caesar episodes. That was a three-parter, right? That was a fun one. I like one. that one as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's up there. I like that one. Toto, hashtag Brain Food Show. I really enjoyed the Warcraft movie. It's not amazing. Ah, oh, this is like a callback to us talking yeah. about comic book mo- uh, things. What was it? Yeah, well, if there was a... Games that became movies. Yeah. Then if there was actually one that was any good. And what was the first one that was good, if any? Oh, yes. I haven't seen Warcraft, have you? 
I have not. I've never played Warcraft. We got a video coming up out about Warcraft. I avoided uh, speaking of that professor uh, uh, earlier. Uh, so she was at one point asked uh, by if she'd get into computer games like World of Warcraft. And she was like, no, because I would love them. And this is mm-hmm. also my exact reason for why I have never touched World of Warcraft, because everything about it seems awesome. And I would love it exactly so much. Exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And it's like you see people getting addicted to this and like that's because yeah. it's really addictive. <laughs> and like I already know I would love it. And so I'm like, yeah. nope, not touching that. I have lots of other things to do. It's like heroin. I'm good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's clearly great. People are really into it. I already so I know I would be. get addicted to it. So I'm going to stay away <laughs> from it. Now I don't know if you're talking about heroin or <laughs> Warcraft, <laughs> but I'm sure the other just by nature of its nature, um, eventually. Yes, I, um, the, the, the biological reaction to heroin is is euphoric. So yeah, <laughs> eventually it would, uh, you know, but yeah, the Warcraft game and uh, no, I haven't seen the Warcraft movie, but yeah, good, mm-hmm. I guess, according to Toto. Do you want to, do you want to guess the Rotten Tomato score? Uh, 62%. It is... Oh, I just googled Rotten Tomatoes, Rotten Tomatoes, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, Warcraft on Rotten You said 62%? percent mm-hmm. You are uh, quite wrong, 27%. Uh, 27%? But the audience, really? audience, 77 That's a lot higher. Oh. Well, yeah, you bound to think critics yeah, hate Yeah, fans, it. fans. These type of movies. I mean, and even like the Marvel movies, that critics always hate those, right? Like, pretty Dude, much. no. No? Really? Dude, Marvel, like, don't some of those do awesome? I feel like critics usually Dude, hate I'm them. I'm pretty sure. Dude, Avengers Infinity Raw War is sitting right now at 83%. Well, it was great. I haven't seen it. Oh. Dude, I saw the new Mission Impossible. Mm-hmm. This is... And, and uh, Fallout. Do you want to get, guess the Rotten Tomatoes score on that? Mm, which one? The new one. Oh, uh, okay. The Fallout. Uh, bad. I'm going to say bad. I'll just say that. Okay. No, give, it, give it a guess. Give it a uh, guess. Don't Google it. 18%. 97. What? It's unbelievably good. It's like, really? I went in. How often do you go into a movie with a 97% score on Rotten Tomatoes and it over delivers? Wow. That's amazing. Never. They've not been that good, I feel like, in a while. They were, I, I feel like when Simon Pegg got involved and they mm-hmm. kind of made them into comedies mm-hmm. rather than oh, into yeah. like serious action movies, yeah. it went from like, first one was good, second one was weak, third one was better. Then did they make it, then did Simon mm-hmm. Pegg get involved and they made it mm-hmm. funny. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, this is now great. Yeah. And this is like less funny, but it's, it's really excellent. And it's like two hours and 20 minutes long and there's no point where you're bored and it's not stupidly complicated like they make these movies mm-hmm. sometimes. So you're like, wait, who wants the nuclear thing with the what now? And yeah. who's that guy? It's, yeah. it's Well, that's good. the thing with these type of movies, like those type of action. People just want to be entertained. That's the whole reason you're not going for quality cinema. And so that's, I think what Marvel does so well is make it funny too because then it's like an extra thing. You, yes. know, that, you know, so it's just pure entertainment, um, which is, you know, what they should be, these type of movies anyway. Yeah. And it, it delivers in every sense. It mm-hmm. is just, it's a it's a great movie. Tom is Tom Cruise is fantastic. Mm-hmm. The other guys, Peg and um, ah, uh, what are these other guys? It's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's a great movie. Anyway, yeah. um, anything else we need to hit, or are we ready to move? I'm on? ready. I'm ready to hear your hear your what's awesome. So I think what we so do you remember we made a video about Putin's walk, like his yes. uh, the gunslinger yes. gate, yes. as they call it. Yeah. Which, just to recap very quickly, go check out our video on it, is basically Putin walks real funny because he was trained by the KGB to kind of always be ready to draw his gun and strike on people, right? So, I got an email when I was on holiday and I kind of let my emails pile up. So I was like, oh, okay, something I'll check out when I get back, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got to go through all, through all of this stuff. I was clearing out my emails yesterday and I opened this thing up and someone had seen our video and it inspired them to write a song about Putin's thing. And I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be very good, whatever. And then I open it up on Spotify and it is, it, it is amazing. It is, I was listening to this yesterday. It's, it's kind of like a, like a poppy, dancey sort of, I don't know mm-hmm. what genre of music it falls into, but it's incredibly catchy. And I've just been listening, I must have listened to it like 20 times since mm-hmm. yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I thought we could, and it's basically, I can't really explain it better than the song can do it itself. So I thought maybe we could play out this episode. I emailed mm-hmm. the guy and said, do you mind if we play it on the podcast? And he was like, no, go for it. That's awesome. awesome. So I thought we could play it out just in full. And I will uh, uh, open, let me just find the guy's name because I want to give him a pro- proper plug. So it's, it's on an album called Walk Like Putin. Uh, sorry, it's a song called Walk Like Putin. It's by an artist called Tom Kirby. 
K R I uh, K I R B Y. Go check him out on Spotify. Uh, I'm going to play this song after the episode ends. It's great. Did you listen to it yet? No, I have not. I haven't. I, I saw the email, but I haven't clicked it yet. After this is done, go listen to this. It's nice. so, so good. It's just, yeah, I love it. Nice. Okay, good. Nice. That's, uh, that's all. Anything else? <laughs> um, no, I think that's all for today. Next time we're going to do uh, lots and lots of space bonus facts. So it'll be rapid fire. Um, and Everyone loves the bonus facts on the uh, YouTube yeah. channel. So. Yeah, and people seem to like the episodes as well. So, uh, and uh, yeah, there'll be a lot. I don't know. It might be two episodes. It might be one long episode. We'll see. We'll see how, how it comes together. Love it. All right. Well, uh, that's it for this Brain Food Show. Leave us a review. Say hi on Twitter with the hashtag Brain Food Show. And now we're uh, over to Tom Kirby and his song Walk Like Putin. Thanks, Tom, for uh, letting us. I feel like a radio DJ right now. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Spin it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's wrap it up there. KGB gunslingers gate Hand poised to draw and to seal your fate Comes from the Kremlin, the snow Just like the henchmen, that's all we know Right hand at the side, don't move it Or so twist to right, come in Walk it out like you are a maker Right hand at the side, don't move it Or so twist to right, come in Get out like you are a maker You're a Russian dictator Gotta walk like Putin Talk like Putin Turn rocks into sand Be prepared to strike